you don't understand. I had an amazing reading month. <laughs> oh, shit. 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 No, 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 no. Oh, no. I read 28 different books, and although quite a few of them were smaller books, the average page count overall was 238 pages for these books. But I did get 6,764 pages read. I still don't understand how. <laughs> so my very smallest book was only one page long and my longest was 480 pages. And whilst we're doing stats, my oldest book was from 1954, my newest was from 2024, no one's surprised there, and my average rating overall was a four star out of 28 books. Also, I listened to 121 hours of audiobook, which is madness. Uh, and then the formats that I read all of these in, like, I have it written down. <laughs> so I read seven paperbacks, two hardbacks, nine audiobooks, two ebooks, three graphic novels or manga, and five books that were mixed between physical formatting and audiobooks. Then for the nationality, I have five English authors, 11 American, one Palestinian, one Australian, one Israeli, that's Ilan Pape, he is pro-Palestine, one Argentinian, two Irish, one Scottish, two Japanese, one Swedish, one Ghanaian, and one Pakistani author. What a month! <laughs> I don't even know how I'm gonna fit, or I'm gonna have to like not go into these, and I read some amazing books this month, but I'm gonna have to keep it locked down. Let's finally dive into the books themselves. The first book is the shortest book I read and that is Death and What Comes Next by Terry Pratchett. This on Goodreads is just one singular page. It's very very short, it was a short story that was released by Pratchett quite a while after where it's inserted into Discworld. Not much to say about it but I did enjoy it. 4.5 stars for this little one. Then Reaper Man also by Terry Pratchett. Uh, I'm reading through the Discworld series to get through so I can read Hogfather during December. This is the entire thing. I adore death so much. This is so fun having death interact more physically with the real world than he has previously. I adored this book so much. And this one also ended up with a 4.5 star. Not quite at the five. So close. So close. I imagine a future death book will hit it. Then I listened to A Reaper at the Gates by Sabah Tahir. This is the third book in the Ember in the Ashes trilogy and it took me a long time to get around to this one. I ended up rating this 3.5 stars and it is a little lower than I'd hoped. Partly middle book syndrome but also partly I just wasn't feeling connected to the characters and I am unsure as to whether that is a me problem and it's been years since I read the first two books or if it's a book problem. One of the reveals got me messaging um, Caitlin from Letters from Kim Reddy in catalogs, but that was it. So I am hoping that book four is a, more of a winner for me and that I do end up getting a bit more out of it now that I'm more into the story again. Lights in Gaza was a net galley arc for me and I think that this was done beautifully. This was an audiobook and it is a collection of short stories, of non-fiction like statements and also of poetry from Palestinian authors from Gaza. This was beautifully done, beautifully written. I really do recommend this one. You can get it for free right now from Hashit's website, from the publisher. They give you the the ebook for free, but you can also, of course, purchase a physical or ebook, or you can get the audiobook now that has been released if that is a better way for you to consume it. This one I gave a very high four stars to, and I really do recommend. Then another NetGalley audiobook, this one just got two and a half stars from me and this one is Medical Robotics Breakthroughs. I spotted this on NetGalley, I read the previous two that were on NetGalley as the audiobooks. They're interesting little books aimed at kids to teach them more about technology and medicine. Another 4.5 star read and that is Hood Feminism by Mickey Kendall. This is such a fantastic book talking about the intersectionality that is needed within feminism and how the primarily white and middle class feminism does not help all women around the globe and it is inherently biased and needs to change. This is very American focused so there were a lot of things that were quite different compared to me over here in Britain, hello. However, still a very very important book to read. This was also incredibly readable, I didn't want to put it down, I was like flying through the chapters which is quite rare for a non-fiction so I do highly recommend it on that side as well. I'm trying to blast through these. <laughs> then God's Grave by Jay Kristoff. I am really annoyed, I gave this five stars, uh, I'm annoyed because Jay Kristoff is a racist piece of shit. I've had these books since before then, all three. Oh my god, this book was perfection. 
I'm so annoyed. The character development, on top of the development that we'd already gotten in book one, with all of the events and all of the reveals, and everything is just done perfectly? How dare he? How... how dare he? <clears throat> then The Poisons We Drink by Bethany Baptiste, which I really wanted to give a higher rating, but it only got a three star from me. This was another NetGalley audiobook. I do think that part of this, <laughs> a fairly big chunk of this, is that this is a YA book. I am not a young adult. <laughs> I am 27 years old. And so I do think that part of this is just that I am outside of this demographic now. And that is okay. I do still think that young adults within this bracket from like 13 to 18, 19 and above will still really enjoy this book. But unfortunately it just wasn't for me. There was so much potential with learning about the magic and also the political system within this kind of world, within our modern day world that has been created. There was so much potential there. The relationships are done beautifully. The re relationships between siblings, between family members, friends, lovers, they are all done beautifully. They are incredibly realistic, incredibly vibrant. They're done so well. But I just personally needed so much more from the world building and I didn't get it. And I'm so disappointed by that. But yes, I do think that this is one that if you're in the age bracket or if you still really love the age bracket, you'll, you'll have a fantastic time. It just wasn't for me. And I'm so sad about that. Then another book on Palestine and that is The Biggest Prison on Earth by Ilan Pape. This is of course based on Gaza and the fact that the Palestinians living in this area cannot leave. This is a fantastic book. I give this four stars. It's just so well written. It really does kind of go through the blow by blows of how Gaza in its current open prison form came to be the ways that Western governments and Western media turned their eyes from what was happening for their own convenience and for their own gain, and how this led to what is quickly becoming a genocide of our people. Uh, so a very hard-hitting one, but very well researched. Ilan Pape is technically Israeli. Um, I believe he's British Israeli, uh, but he was actually born in Israel. So my man has very little bias going on here because he was brought up my camera stopped mid-rant and that is probably for the best, but this is very well written, I highly recommend. It's very educational, very well researched. I recommend. <laughs> Moving on from my rant. Next up I read Soundless by Rochelle Mead. This one I gave 2.5 stars. Unfortunately this was not uh, one of my favourite books. Uh, this has a lot of potential but it has a Chinese setting and is said to be kind of based around Chinese mythology, but there is nothing in here that links it to any culture specifically. Like, unless I'm missing some sort of small, nuanced aspect, which I very much could be, but this is a YA book, so it is aimed at younger audiences, and I am not noticing anything that links it to anywhere other than the names. This could be literally anywhere. This could be in Ohio. This could be in Company Durham. This could be in the middle of Bavaria. There's nothing <laughs> that tells you where this is set and putting it, like, being Asian-inspired and Chinese-inspired just seems like a marketing ploy from 2015. Um, additionally, there's a lot of sign language used in here. The characters from the village are deaf. The sign language representation isn't fantastic. Any time that it isn't physically necessary to explain that they are definitely talking in sign language, it's more just done as though they're mind reading each other and speaking telepathically. There's no emphasis on like the movement of hands. Like there's no like, like gesture dramatically or anything like that. It's all just like, yeah, no, no, they're, they're, they're signing, they're signing, you know? Writes as if they're talking, but they're signing! Ugh. Yeah. So I had some issues with this. The, the concept of the plot itself is one that I am quite interested in. Like, there's a group of people who are being enslaved and they don't know it. Kind of similar to Red Rising, I guess, <laughs> now that I'm saying it out loud. Um, but yeah, the plot is great, but just the execution, unfortunately, wasn't there for me. And also, um, <laughs> the romantic relationship in here, this book is 260 plus pages long. The romantic relationship does not have enough page count whilst also dealing with the slavery and the racism and the ableism that is within this book for you to actually give a damn about the relationship. Then next up, The Hunting Moon. Why did I do this to myself? 1.5 stars. That is higher than I thought I was going to rate it. I read The Luminaries last month, the month before, and didn't enjoy it. <laughs> it's very childish. Uh, all my complaints are the same. This book is 
written exactly the same. Um, there is not enough for me personally development, but it's the childish writing that is the problem. Um, nothing is left to imagination, nothing is left to the reader, including using onomatic onomatopoeic sounds in a YA book. This is not intended for seven-year-olds. They don't need... No, mm, mm. I will just rant and we don't have time for that this month because I read too many books. This series, I now know firmly where I fall on Susan Dennard's writing and it is deeply on the do not enjoy side. Will not be trying Truth Witch. These, this and the Illuminaries will be getting sold. So um, if you want them, let me know. <laughs> not good. Not good. Then for a book that had so much potential and I think it is me, not the book, genuinely, and that is Little Eyes by Samantha Treblin. I gave this one four stars. It... <laughs> this book is really dark, don't get me wrong, but I am, uh, shall we say, chronically online, and to be honest, the stuff I saw in this book is mild compared to what we're seeing online right now. Not just with what's happening in Palestine, but just generally the things that we see, the things that we're exposed to, the things that come up on my Twitter feeds, on my news feeds, are more dramatic than this. Everything that happened in this book, I expected. And I was really hoping to get shocked by something. And the only time that I got shocked at all was in the very first chapter, just because I didn't know quite how dark the book was gonna get and how quickly. But the second it did that, everything else was then like, okay, cool. <laughs> the prospect of this is that there are these little creatures and you can either purchase this little fluffy creature and it'll roam around your house, or you can purchase an access key to watch through the camera in the creature and watch people's houses. All of the disgusting things and also some of the nice and cute things that you can imagine are in here. Like, it's brilliantly written. It's very difficult to put down. The writing is done fantastically. This is translated from Spanish. The author is Argentinian and the translation is done beautifully. Like, this is a fantastic book. I am just fucked in the brain. So it got four stars. <laughs> Then 3.5 stars is Scarlet by Genevieve Cogman. This one I was offered from the publishers the chance to get a review copy of book two and I hadn't read book one yet so I picked up book one. This is a vampire story, it's set around the French Revolution but we're following primarily English characters and that is an aspect of the French Revolution that I've never seen before and as someone who is British is interesting to me. I don't know that it would be interesting to everyone around the world, but as someone who is from a country that has historically had much beef with the French, but also would have been concerned about the political ramifications of the revolution and what it could have done to the British monarchy and class system, it was really interesting to see that played out in here. I also really enjoyed how that was brought up. It wasn't just like, oh yeah, sure, that must be happening, and it's not mentioned. The character, our main character Scarlet, brings it up and mentions it, and I like that. Um, I do think that the romantic relationship in here is a little unbelievable. <laughs> I did it. I, I finally read this. I'm very happy. It's been sat on my TBR for a while. It is a very quick read as well, so if you have this one floating around your TBR, I recommend picking it up because you will absolutely fly through it. Then I listened to The Empress of Salt and Fortune by Nevo, and I I gave this one four stars. I really enjoyed this. It's like a telling of one of the fall downs of one of the Chinese emperors. I'm not gonna lie to you, I have very little knowledge about East Asia and their monarchy, their ruling class, their empires and their dynasties. It's something that I will need to look into in the future. I have no knowledge of right now. So I don't know which one this was, but it's a very interesting way of doing it. It's a novella, it's a really short story, and I really enjoy that for this one, whilst nobility and upper class people are mentioned and are in the story, we are focusing on learning about this collapse of an empire through one of the slave women. What I would say is, I definitely would like to continue in the series. I listened to the other book later in the month, we'll get to that as we go on. Part of the reason why this month was absolute madness is that I spent one Saturday uh, just reading and I went through seven very small books. So let's dive into those ones. I won't go into them too much. I'm trying not to do that anyway and failing, uh, but I will go into these ones less because obviously there's going to be a vlog out for this. I read Bad Magic by Derek Landy. I gave this one a 4.5. It was really really fun to see the depictions brought to life of what Landy imagines in his head. It's very different to what I've been imagining and yet 
also not too far. Uh, and it's a very classic Skullduggery Pleasant story. I struggle to give graphic novels five star ratings. I feel like I personally never get invested enough in them, but I did really, really like this one. Five star perfection in novella form. Rizio by Denise Mina. I need to read the other two books that are in this little series, which is Hex and Nothing Left to Fear from Hell from the Darkland Tales. This is a slightly fictionalised but only slightly depiction of the assassination of Mary Queen of Scots advisor Rizzio. It is done beautifully, it is engaging, it is capturing, the writing is perfect, I was laughing out loud! This was a recommendation from Hannah from Ladder M. Mm. Mm. Three stars for this one, Animal Crossing New Horizons Deserted Island Diaries Volume 3 by Coconut Rumba. Huh. This manga is very childish, very silly, but it's fun, and I love Animal Crossing. There's literally all there is to say about that one. Then 3.5 stars, almost a 4, but Corpile wouldn't give me it, and that is Mio's Kingdom by Astrid Lindgren. This was gifted to me by the wonderful Veronica from Veronica's Shelf, and I love Lindgren's writing. I've now read three stories from her, and her writing is, at least the way it's been translated into English, is always quite familiar in a way that when it's used within children's stories it's quite comforting. You know this story but it's still a joy to read, it's still so nice to sit and read and enjoy the tale. I would love to read Lindgren's work in Swedish one day, I just think it might take me a few decades. <laughs> I never thought that I would love this. Open Water by Caleb Zimmer Nelson is technically a romance book, but this is so much more. This got a 4.5 rating for me. I was speechless when I finished this. Hi, it's me, I don't get speechless. This is a story about black love, primarily set in London, and the way that being black in Britain impacts every aspect of your life. This is beautifully written. It, despite being very small, is a very slow read. Be aware of that going in if you do decide to pick this one up. But it is beautiful. Every word is utilised. I, it, it's so good. It's so good. Another manga, Kirby Manga Mania Volume 1 by Hirokazu Hikawa. I gave this one 3.5 stars, so a little bit higher than the Animal Crossing one. The artwork is a little bit more detailed, and despite being childish, like it still is, it's less childish than the Animal Crossing one. There's a bit more depth in this. I really enjoyed it. It's my first ever Kirby manga, and I would like to read some more. And then my last read from that one day, and that is The Last White Man by Mohsin Hamid. I have changed my thoughts since the vlog. Slightly. I still think this is a fascinating topic. Uh, this is getting a four star from me, so it's still getting a good rating. However, this story of everyone changing skin tones from white to a dark complexion is written for a white audience in mind. And so when I had just finished it, which is when I did the vlog, I filmed the entire thing in one day. And when I had just finished it, I was like, wow, that's amazing. And then as I sat with it more, I was annoyed that Hamid hadn't done more with the potential plot lines that are brought up from being in an area where everyone is slowly turning dark-skinned is the, ter the term that he uses in the book. Um, and so when everyone is slowly turning dark-skinned and the racism is touched on, of course, but I feel like it could have went more in-depth, it's very much a surface-level analysis. But then on top of that, not only are people's skin tones changing, but their entire facial structure is changing too. Of course, if you just change my skin tone darker, I would still look white. And so the actual structure of people's faces is changing. They don't have the same face anymore. And having an entirely different face look back at you in the mirror would be so disturbing, regardless of what that face looks like. <laughs> like if I suddenly looked in the mirror and I looked like Scarlett Johansson, I would be freaked out. You know, like, she's a very pretty woman, but that's not my face. And that's just from the same race, let alone then also having the racial alterations with all of the inbuilt racism, the systemic racism, and potentially overt racism that someone may have. And none of it was touched on. It was all so surface level. I think it's a very good book for people who are just kind of being introduced into discussions on racism and on white supremacy and I do think it's a fascinating concept and it's really well written. It was really easy to just read through this, it's great writing, but there was just so much potential that wasn't utilised for a deeper story. And yes, it would have meant it wasn't a novella, but that would have made it so much better. So it's such 
such a pity that more wasn't done with this book. We're on the last stretch, folks. So, The Witchfinder's Sister by Beth Underdown. I rated this one 3.5 stars, and I'm so glad I finally finished this. I've had this book since 2016. I have thought about unhauling this book many times, but felt guilty because my friend gave it to me. She is one of my best friends from childhood. <laughs> so I was like, God damn it. And I had tried to read it, and I was in a slump, and it just wasn't the time for it. So I DNF'd it. Didn't help its case. Finally got through it eventually. Once I had hit, like I was at around 60 pages before, once I hit the 100 page mark, I was having a great time. Once I finally hit the 100 page mark, I was enjoying this book. It was, it's really well written. I think just, I didn't want to read it because I knew what it was about, if that makes sense. So we are following the sister, who is potentially fictionalised, we don't know if this person had any sisters, of a real life known witch finder in the 1600s in the UK. And how she tries to influence him in his witch finding, tries to stop him, tries to save these women, but inevitably ends up causing further downfall, further harm, and how she deals with this as a woman herself. And it's really well written, it's really fast paced once you actually get into it, it's really insidious as well. And I just, I knew that it was going to be a tough one. I'm so glad that I finally finished it. 3.5 stars is still a great rating. And one thing I really loved about this is that the research done into it was fantastic. And there are actually short excerpts of it. Um, they're very small parts of it. Um, but they actually use like transcripts from real life. Um, and like statements from things that actually happened in the court records of the time. The names of the women who were murdered for being witches are also used. The research that Beth Underdown did into this is fantastic and to be applauded. And the last line of this book, I don't want to spoil it for you, um, but <laughs> Beth? Then a five star read and that is A Mindful of Murder by Derek Landy, the 16th Skullduggery Pleasant book. Yes, that is why I finally read all the short books. Uh, I obviously love this. Five stars, a Skullduggery Pleasant, who doesn't enjoy this? It is difficult to tell you what this is about. We are on book 16. I adore this. I adore the banter. Who doesn't love a sassy skeleton? It's just so fun. It's just so enjoyable. It's just so dramatic. I read this in one day because of course I did. Okay, look, I have a whole video on Skullduggery and even though that video is now multiple years old and therefore out of date because so much has come out since, I still adore the series. Another five star read. Sorrowland by River Solomon. I was pushed to pick this one up for the trans rights readathon. I say pushed. I looked for trans books on my shelves. This is one of them. River Solomon is non-binary. This book is perfection. Utter perfection. I had no clue what this was. I just wanted it because it was River Solomon and I adore everything that they write. Uh, it turns out that we are following a young girl who is 13 years old when she escapes from a all-black cult in the United States. This is done brilliantly. It discusses religion, racism, sexism. It discusses survivalism and the encroachment of indigenous lands. It is... it is done beautifully. This is... it has solidified River Solomon as a favourite author for me. I have now read three books by them and I have adored every single one. They have all got five stars. Their books are just fantastic. Their way with prose is utterly beautiful. I... Mm, if you have thought about picking this one up, do it. Then another teeny tiny book. This one is eight pages long and that is Compulsory by Martha Wells. It is the 0 0.5th half book in the Murderbot series. It's a prequel. It's super short. It's just a fun little story that kind of tells you a little bit about before All Systems Red. It's teeny tiny. It's barely a book, but it is a book. And therefore, it is mentioned today. Uh, and I gave that one 4.5 stars. Then another five star read. I was smashing them out at the end of the month and that is The Transgender Issue by Sean Fay. So this is another one that I picked up for the Trans Right Readathon and it is a non-fiction. This is done impeccably. So Sean Fay is a trans straight white woman living in the UK and despite the fact that she comes with a lot of privileges, despite the fact she also has a lot of non-privileges being trans at all, she still then manages to make sure that each and every single chapter and every single point and every single topic brought up for discussion includes intersectionality. Whether that is the intersectionality of different sexual attractions, whether that is disability, whether that is race, whether that is just simply the different countries that you are living in, it is done 
brilliantly. It's just done so well and the discussions are important regardless of what country you live in for the transgender people who are potentially in your life even if you do not know it. And it's just, oh, it's so, again, it's another one that's really readable. The discussions that are brought up are absolutely fantastic. And I feel like it's even more important now than ever, especially in the UK with all of the transgender hatred that is becoming more and more popular in this country. It's a really important book. I'm so glad that I finally read it. It is absolutely amazing. I will be recommending it to everyone, including you. Pick this one up. We have two more left. Both are quite short. So the first is More Tales of the City by Armistead Morbin. I picked this up technically just on a whim and it turns out it works for the Trans Rare Readathon and I was reading it in that time. Very happy about that. This is a series that I never would have picked up without being pushed to by my wonderful uncle who runs a page called On This Gay Day, talks about historical events, happenings, births, deaths, etc. in the LGBTQ plus community. And he gifted me this entire series and I am so glad he did. I never would have picked it up otherwise. It's a historical 50s contemporary. I don't like contemporary. Oh my god, I love these books. They're so good. For starters, both of them so far have had a mystery in. Fun. I love a mystery. Love it. And that like goes throughout the book. Like, I'm here for that. Like, I feel like this should be highlighted. But then also, it's just written so well and so engagingly and they're so enjoyable. I'm coming to love these characters so, so much. I really like this series now and I'm so, so glad that my uncle essentially pushed the series onto me because I'm having a fantastic time and I'm really excited to dive into further tales of the city at some point soon. And I did give this one a four star rating in the end, so I'm so happy I picked it up. And then the final book that I read this month, finally, <laughs> is When the Tiger Came Down the Mountain by Nevo. This is, as I mentioned before, the second book in that series. Um, I, I give this one 4.5 stars. I enjoyed this one somehow a lot more than The Empress of Salt and Fortune, despite the fact that they're both beautifully written. This one has the same main character. Oh, these also both work for the Trans Right Readathon, just FYI. Uh, so these both have the same main character and they are non-binary, I believe, and they are going around this world that they live in and gathering stories to have correct archive stories for their religious kind of like monastery that they work with and that they live with and in this one they are up a mountain and some tigers appear and the tigers want to eat them and our protagonist is like hello i what about this story is it true and so you have them the protagonist, they are telling the tigers this story and the tigers are going, that bit's wrong, that bit's wrong, that bit's wrong. How offensive, fix that bit. That bit's funny, but not quite right. And it's a fantastic, engaging way of storytelling. I loved it, it was so much fun. Uh, and this has solidified my love for the series. Like the first one was like, yeah, that's fun, sure. Second one, mm, mm, 4.5, almost five star. What a great book. Uh, uh, Mm, had a fantastic time with it. So I am really looking forward to reading books three and four of that one. And we are done. Finally. That is all 28 books that I read in one month. I was very tempted to try and make it 31 books in 31 days, um, but I was burnt out to fuck. And whilst quite a few of those books were, you know, audiobooks or net galley and things like that. So a lot of them weren't physically on my shelves. I did still get can I hold them all? Just. Uh, I did still get quite a few books physically off of my TBR, which uh, is something that I am very bad at and I'm very glad to have done this time around. So yeah, uh, have you read any of these? You've probably read at least one or have at least one on your TBR. Come on, there's 28 of the things here. If you've read any of them, please let me know your thoughts on them down below. And also, what was your favourite book of the month? Don't make me choose. I mean, like, part of me is like, obviously this is one, but then like this. And then this, and then there's more. Rizzio is further down that stack. I'm not unstacking them. Um, but yeah, let me know your favourite book of the month. If you would like to see the books that I'm hoping to read in April, a lot less than this. <laughs> a lot smaller. But that is there for you to watch if you'd like to. And if you'd like to see how I manage in April and just how ridiculous my reading gets over the year, because I've already read 52 books and my aim for the year was 50, then please do hit subscribe and I will see you folks in the next video. Bye! Thank you.